I want to just say to um, my friend from the Flathead that ran for Congress, <laughs> thank you so much. I, I absolutely agree with how, how much value there is in spending the time to travel around the state of Montana and meet all the most, the most incredible and amazing folks in this state. And if I could just give you, share one quick story about, I guess, running for office, because I mean, that's obviously something that really just pushes you outside your box, in particular if you're kind of shy. And it may be hard for you to believe, but I used to be kind of shy myself. And when I was in uh, high school, um, I had, took my first speech and drama class, and I absolutely was scared to death to stand in front of a room and speak. And uh, I, I would literally take an F or a zero as opposed to get up and give a speech. But I could do drama. So I, was willing, I did competitive drama in high school. And so I think it was through that process I became a little more comfortable. But the very first time that I had to actually get up in front of a room and say something when I ran for office, I ran for the legislature. And uh, I was in Heisham, Montana. And it was on a Sunday afternoon. And there was all these candidates and people, and we're having this nice, you know, potluck. And uh, I didn't realize I was going to have to speak. God, who would knew, you know? You're running for office, right? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of jump in the pool without knowing what I'm doing sometimes. And uh, all of a sudden, they start asking all the candidates to speak. <clears throat> and I thought, oh my god, I have to say something. <laughs> And literally, I started shaking, and my palms were sweating, and I got a stomach ache. And then it got to me, and I stood up. I babbled something to this day. I have no idea what I said. <coughs> and I sat back down, and I looked at my husband. And I said, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> I obviously got over it. <coughs> but um, I also want to go ahead now and introduce my very good friend, Jesse Laslovich, who is the chief legal counsel in my office. Uh, Jesse also served in the legislature. We served in the House together before he decided to move up to the, <clears throat> he feels, more important Senate chamber. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. But before that, Jesse also um, served in the Attorney General's office as well. And uh, we are really pleased to have him here today to talk to you about how to prevent yourself from becoming a victim of financial fraud. So, Jesse. Thank you. Appreciate Help me. That. Well, good morning, and thank you, Monica, uh, for that introduction. I'm really pleased to be here, very intimidated um, to be here uh, at the outset. Let me uh, acknowledge that, but um, very impressed with the uh, turn turnout, and I want to commend and salute all of you um, for taking time today to uh, listen to what I think is a very, very good program. I'm here to talk about financial exploitation or fraud. In the last panel, I thought, did a very, very good job talking about risk taking. And I think one thing that um, people uh, use interchangeably that is a big mistake is high risk versus fraud. And some people think that because they invested in a high risk product that, okay, uh, they, they uh, took on that risk and they suffer the losses. That's true. Some other people think that because they were defrauded, well, it was risky, so the burden is on the person who invested. That is false. So I'm going to focus on the, the kinds of things that folks can do to be on the lookout for when somebody is committing or attempting to commit financial exploitation. I, I, I will just briefly talk about it. The, our office, St. Otter's office, led by an extraordinary woman in, in Monica Lindine. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> I have to say it for another year. Um, and then uh, I also want to acknowledge another extraordinary woman in Lynn Egan, who uh, is our Deputy Securities Commissioner, uh, who, who makes the Securities Department run um, and produces extraordinary results. I know you heard from her uh, earlier. Uh, so two very smart, um, extraordinary women who are teaching us young, ignorant uh, men uh, how, to, how to do their job. But we, we're, the, we're the Consumer Protection Agency. It's a statutory duty to protect Montana consumers, both on the security side and the insurance side. Before I get started, I just, I'll, uh, 
play this very short clip from a documentary that our office did. Um, Bill Pullman, who lives in a ranch outside of Boulder. Do you guys know Bill Pullman? He was the president in Independence Day. Uh, really great guy. But these are two cases that, that we prosecute in our office under Monica's uh, leadership. And Catherine Brown here is one of the victims in one of our securities fraud cases. You know, he would invest it and he would make money. And at times, yes, he did make money. I think the toughest thing was to, when this case broke, and here they'd saved all this money so carefully and done without for so many years so that they would have it, um, it was suddenly not there. But I never really knew anything was wrong until this thing broke open. For someone else to have taken that without their knowledge was devastating. So I was floored like everybody else and realized that you've really been taken for a ride. And to think that they may have been in the poorhouse. Um, my mother was nearly evicted from the nursing home she stayed at because the funds were not there. There was no money left. So I took his word for it. I trusted him. And that came back to bite me. So we're selling copies of that outside the, the office. No, no, we're not. Um, so the, I don't know how to get off of this uh, screen now. All right, I won't screw it up anymore. So I'm going to talk about uh, that uh, case when we talk about some of these scams, but what this boils down to is trust. And Montanans are inherently, I think, trusting. Uh, and you see it particularly when it comes to pyramid schemes. And pyramid schemes are something that uh, sound so good, so good. Uh, and there, there's a very um, subtle difference between a pyramid scheme and a multi-level distribution uh, firm. A pyramid scheme is when you're getting paid to recruit other people. At the end of the day, if someone comes to you and says, I have this opportunity, you pay me $300, and then you all you have to do to make money is you have to recruit your family, your, fr your friends, uh, people you go to church with. You'll get $100 per head. Uh, th that sounds really easy. It's a pyramid scheme. And you would be shocked at how many pyramid schemes we've had in Montana. And our office is responsible for prosecuting uh, them. So on the right there, it's FHTM, Fortune High Tech Marketing. Anybody hear that? Fortune High Tech Marketing? A few years ago, of course, Lynn, stop it. You don't count. <laughs> Uh, but the Fortune High Tech Marketing, what, they sold phones, and that's the other thing. It's not, as, it's not as simple as just, you know, you're getting paid to recruit people. There's usually a bogus product. And FHTM was doing this across the country. They were selling uh, phones. The phones weren't working, but they were, uh, that was the, the scheme. Uh, but people were making their money by recruiting um, uh, other people. So we went after them, and uh, they paid a million dollars back in restitution to Montanans. They paid a $50,000 fine, and we required them to change their business practices so that they, you get more money from selling the product rather than recruiting people. Because the law says that if you get more than 50% of your income from recruiting people, it's a pyramid scheme. So remember that. And you'll see this pyramid, how it, 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 it's, it really is a joke uh, how they work. So you start at the top, right, level one. And, the, and on the right-hand side, as the number gets bigger, is the amount of uh, people that you need to recruit. Well, <laughs> look, at, look at down here, level, level 11 is more people than the, in our country. <laughs> and down on 13, more people than, in, in, than exist in, in the world. So you can see very quickly um, how the pyramid scheme just doesn't work. And the people who are at the top, the people who started it, are the ones who are making uh, all the money. I talked a little bit about the multi-level uh, marketing uh, firms, and that's the, the selling of the, the, the product. Um, and I want to give you a few, few examples. Uh, Avon is a, is a multi-level uh, marketing firm that's doing things the right way. Pampered Chef. My wife loves Pampered Chef. <laughs> Silpata. If you, if you buy jewelry, they're doing it the right way. They're not pyramid schemes because they're focused on selling the product. Now, do they recruit reps? Sure, they do. And they're getting, and the people who recruit them are getting paid. Was it 50% of the income? No, it's not. The key to remember too, and so in, to, to, the, to the protection piece, if you want to know, 
someone comes to you with a, a pitch of a product, uh, call us because there are two things that, they, that folks have to do if they want to uh, run a, an MLM in Montana. They have to be a member of the Direct Sellers Association, that's in the law, and we can look that up or you can look on Direct, Sell Direct Selling so Association website. Or if they're not, they have to be registered with us. They have to have filed with us. And so when, we, when you do call about whatever it is, um, and they're not a member of the DSA, and they're not registered with us, bet you a million dollars it's a pyramid scheme. So please do call us. Turning now to promissory notes, and people think uh, promissory notes uh, aren't securities. Mistake. They're a security. And a promissory note is, is what we all understand it to be, that I need money, uh, so I'm going to... Um, uh, well, I, 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 whether I need money or, or invest money, but you, you can see uh, I'm, I'm promising to pay back in full whatever I borrowed and, uh, uh, plus interest to uh, the investor. I'm setting aside the, the promissory notes that are is, issued by financial institutions. These are the promissory notes that are issued by uh, an individual that are ripe with fraud. Usually with promissory notes, in, in this instance, if I'm an investor and I, I'm going to give money and I'm, and I'm getting a guaranteed rate of, of return, it's a high rate of return, it should be a huge, huge uh, red flag. Um, we've had multiple promissory note scams that are in the, I mean, millions and millions of dollars right here in Missoula County and in the, up through the Lake County and, and Flathead County. Lynn, $16 million uh, with Cornerstone, do you remember? Uh, 16 million where uh, folks couldn't uh, get access to, to money from your traditional financial institutions. These folks decided that there was an opportunity to make money by getting in this hard uh, lending market, uh, found some people who had money to, to uh, give them the money for the invest, to give to the folks who needed the money, and yet um, uh, we're running a Ponzi scheme, we're skimming off the top. Um, and uh, for a little while it worked, and that's how these things typically work. You get the money, and, and you're an investor, and you get some money back on your investment. Oh, this thing's working out really well, and then it collapses. We had another case in, in Bozeman, five and a half million dollars. He had 140 victims across the country, and, and we had victims in other countries as well, um, where he was making payments on the promissory notes that the investors have made it, he was running a Ponzi scheme, stole the money. I'll get into that one, under the Ponzi scheme discussion. Everything collapsed. And what do you think? And he was sending monthly updates to the investors. Here's, here's how much your investment's worth. Um, when we told the investors that the money was gone, they didn't believe us. We tried the case two Decembers ago. We had to fly in investors from uh, these other states who were big investors. And they still, the day of the trial, thought we were wrong. And they said to us, we got these statements from this person for our, for our promissory notes. And the statements were absolutely bogus. Uh, again, um, the, the, so uh, the theme of this presentation is please call us. If there are any questions, please call us uh, before you do it. And even if after you do it, please call us. In the case in Bozeman I referenced, Somebody was embarrassed to call us. I started at the beginning where people think that the burden and the blame should be on them when they're defrauded. No. It's on the person, it's on the criminal who committed the act. Um, and so they think, oh, they've just done it to me. I'm embarrassed. I'm not going to call. That one person who called on the Reynolds case in Bozeman, he's currently in prison, resulted in another 140 victims, all of whom didn't know that they were being victimized because of one phone call. So. Uh, I can't overemphasize calling us at the beginning, and even if it's not at the beginning, then calling us at the end. Our good friend Charles Ponzi, um, I shouldn't say good friend, um, he, uh, he was smart in the 1920s, started running a, a, a Ponzi scheme that involved stamps. Um, and uh, a Ponzi scheme is very simple. I, I go to Lynn and say, I have this investment opportunity, give me $100,000. She'll do it. She trusts me. And then I'll go to Monica and say, I have this investment opportunity. Uh, she'll, you know, $100,000. And when I promised Lynn I'm going to give her $25,000 back, how do I come up with the $25,000? Oh, I've got this $100,000 from Monica. I'm going to give Lynn a part of Monica's money. When the economy is doing well, that Ponzi scheme is working. Uh, so it's, the Ponzi scheme at its core is you're paying back old investors with new investor money. That's what a Ponzi scheme is. 
and, and it happens, you would be shocked. And we all know about our, uh, Bernie Madoff. And when this, when this happened, all went down, he ran a $35 billion Ponzi scheme. $35 billion. And he was ordered to pay $17 billion back by a federal judge. Of course, he's serving the remainder of his life in prison. Um, and when this was all happening, I started at the office as an attorney in 2009. I thought, Ponzi, yeah, this doesn't happen in Montana. This is ridiculous. It happens. It's, you'd be shocked. And again, it goes back to that we're trusting of our friends. You have, your friends are going to do it to you. In uh, one instance, we had a family member, a guy who was running for governor uh, at the time, who was uh, scamming uh, his family members um, with... Uh, a Ponzi scheme. So you see our Richard Reynolds, this was after he was convicted, uh, interestingly walked out of the courtroom with a chair over his head. I don't understand that. <laughs> he said he had a bad back. <laughs> um, again, this, and, and, for, and the other part of this too, and why folks can call us and check on um, whether this is a legitimate, or, no, I don't, I, we can't say it's legitimate, but we can see red flags. People are selling you investment, they need to be registered. Generally, they need to be registered with our office. The security needs to be registered with our office. There are certainly exceptions, but calling us uh, can make a, a big difference. Unsuitable investments, another common uh, scam that are typically run by people who are actually licensed uh, uh, representative or registered representatives. Um, and for every investment you make, I go to my advisor and I want, I want these uh, certain, uh, I have these obje investment objectives. I, I'm young so I can be high risk. Uh, my age, what my sophistication is, my liquidity needs, what's my risk tolerance, any other factors. That all has to be analyzed by your broker for your investment. The broker just simply can't put everything, all the investment opportunities, all the stuff that he thinks is good for everybody in his uh, portfolio, all of his clients. There was a person in, in Helena that, we're, uh, that we ended up shutting down and got, got out of the business who worked for Edward Jones. Put all of his clients into uh, natural resources stock and gold and silver investment. All of his clients, despite the age, despite their risk tolerance, their sophistication, everybody had the same kind of investment. Completely unsuitable. And I don't, Lynn, how, uh, lots of money, $700,000? $730,000 that we got Edward Jones to pay back to, uh, to their clients. They did right by their, their clients. And the person who did it is no longer in the industry. So this is a, a summary of, again, call us if you have questions. I'll give Lynn's cell phone out uh, when we're done with this. <laughs> but uh, one size does not fit all. It's a puzzle. So when you are investing and you're going to your, your, your broker, please make sure that you're um, that your broker is going through individually with you with all the items. This is a picture of Lynn's uh, exotic animal. Um, so exotic investments. I mean, it, it is, it, it, it's, I, I like the, the term, what, what do you mean by this? And it, it, these are the ones that are, are fancy. We, you know, we really don't quite understand. They sound really, really good they're highly, highly risky. And for exotic investments, um, we need to uh, look before we jump, certainly need a parachute if we're jumping high from a, a high point. But you, if you don't have a high net worth, shouldn't be doing exotic investments. If you don't understand it, don't do exotic investments. What are some examples? Anybody see the movie The Big Short? Or re, if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. I've read the book. Mike, Michael Lewis wrote The Big Short. Uh, and this is about a group of people who saw the bubble bursting uh, when our economy tanked and we had the Great Recession. And they're the ones who bet against the, the housing market. Everybody was telling them, you're wrong, you're crazy. Um, you want entertainment and you want something to make your blood boil, watch The Big Short or read the book. Um, it's really, really good. Credit default swaps, these collateral, collateralized debt obligations. Everybody, what are these? I don't understand these. These subprime loans. Um, and the, a few folks made a lot of money because they saw that, the, that it was unsustainable, that the housing market was unsustainable, and they flat took advantage of um, some of these big firms that were saying, 
uh, no, the housing, the housing uh, market is, is incapable of, of bursting. But uh, th that would be a type of an exotic um, investment. In churning and uh, unauthorized trading, you have, uh, you're with a firm and, and you have uh, accounts with the firm and all of a sudden you, you get your statement from, the, from your, your broker and there are lots of trades that are occurring in your accounts that you didn't authorize. That's fraud. And if that's happening, we need to know about it and that person will no longer be a stockbroker. Similarly, what we see far too often is churning in people's accounts. And churning is just simply a way of, of doing what's best for me as the broker rather than what's best for you as the investor. I'm doing it because I'm getting commissions. We had an individual in Butte uh, prior to my time, Lynn was still at the office, who, had a, a, who was doing, conducting excessive churning uh, in his clients' accounts, millions of dollars if I recall, um, and hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in commissions he was earning uh, off of the, the churning in the, the client's accounts, and that person is in prison. Yes, ma'am? Well, it's typically, yeah, it's a good question. The question is, what's the statute of limitations? So you have to know about it or reason, it's know or have a reasonable likelihood of, of knowing about it, and then you get three years. Now, you, there, there's, there's some exceptions to that, but generally, if this happened in 2008 and you didn't know about it, and then you just found out about it a year ago, we're going to be fine. Or if we found out about it, we're going to be fine. There, there has to be a knowledge, um, a knowledge element. I didn't put this picture on there. I don't know why that's on there. <laughs> um, so the key to, to this piece and what this shocked me being in this, this uh, position is people don't open their accounts, their statements. It's incredible. So the, one of the people profiled, one of the victims profiled in our Gold Digger documentary, she would get these the statements. Her husband, unfortunately, died in a tragic accident, um, had life insurance, invested the money. The statement would come to the mail and go in the garbage. She wouldn't even open it. And, and her broker was uh, doing bad things in her account and uh, stealing money uh, from her, essentially. She didn't know it, but taking these exotic vacations. Um, and she's no longer in her business and served time in prison as well. Natural resource scam, certainly in Montana, right, with the Bakken, all the development going on uh, there. Uh, highly risky, very illiquid. Um, something that people should look very sus uh, suspiciously upon when someone approaches you on a natural resource investment. If they're talking about uh, an expert geologist who's saying this is going to be a boom, uh, making guarantees about uh, a, a kind of uh, um, gold or silver that they're, that they're going to find and that you're going to win, <coughs> get a lot of money, people should be very suspicious about. In that Richard Reynolds case, the guy with the chair over his head, he had he, he apparently, um, he said he owned gold mines um, and people were investing and he didn't own jack. Uh, crowdfunding, anybody heard of crowdfunding? Mm -hmm. So we in Montana, Monica, to her credit, said we're going to try to do crowdfunding. The SEC, um, uh, or under the Jobs Act, Congress passed it, said we wanted to do crowdfunding. The SEC had to promulgate rules. The SEC, uh, frankly, dragged their feet. And so we said the various states that we're, we want to do it in, in our our own state. So this is just a mechanism to get money from a crowd of people. And in Montana, if you want to be able to crowdfund for your business opportunity, you have to only, and, and you're going to use the exemption, the big thing about the crowdfunding means you, you don't need to be uh, a registered, uh, registered with our office in order to crowdfund. But you can only solicit people within the state, so it's intrastate, and the amount per person is no more than $10,000. Um, this is, and so it's, it's, we're proud of it because it's a way for, for businesses, startup businesses to, to easily access uh, money, uh, Montana money particularly, don't have to go through someone who's registered with us. But the other part of it is, uh, the statistic is ha the half of the businesses that start up uh, fail. Uh, so this is not a, what I would qualify as a safe uh, investment, and if you have the money and and, uh, and certainly believe in the cause, uh, then $10,000, then 
or 5,000, whatever it is, then, then do it. But this is something that people should be uh, very uh, careful about. Now, so the difference is, yeah, I'll get to your question. So let, let me, I should have said this. So we have these, uh, the GoFundMe and the Kickstarter and uh, Indiegogo. Um, the, there's a difference between what they do and what a, a business is starting, uh, is seeking to start uh, up as. So these are um, that we see, you know, unfortunately, when there's a tragedy in a family and somebody sets up a GoFundMe and then I'm donating money. That's not what we're talking about with crowdfunding. We're talking, and for what I'm talking about is crowdfunding where I'm giving money, I'm giving $10,000 to this startup with an expectation that I'm gonna get a return on that investment. With these, the Kickstarter and GoFundMe, I'm, I, there's no expectation. I'm, I'm donating money. So there's a, even though this is crowdfunding, it's not crowdfunding from the investment sense. Does that make sense? I hope that, uh, yes ma'am, you had a question. No, the question is uh, being registered with our office is the same as being registered with the Secretary of State. That is uh, no. So the Secretary of State is just the business uh, piece of it that is, that is registered. It's very simple. And being with us is going to be more complicated. That's going to actually, you'll probably likely have to do both. But you definitely want to be registered with us if you're going to start soliciting uh, investors. Uh, otherwise, um, there's going to be, Monica just said you're getting in trouble. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, there'll be problems. So definitely not the same thing. We're two separate entities. So the question is, so long as they're registered with us, you can do a Kickstarter with someone out of state. So the, crowd, the crowdfunding exemption is only applicable to those within Montana. So if you want to start your, and the SEC is promulgating rules, and under the, their rules, you'll be able to do it intrastate, uh, or excuse me, interstate. <laughs> so you'll be able to do it in all the other states. But under our exemption, it's, it's only limited to Montana, to Montana investors. Okay. Uh, again, uh, calling us, and we can help. There's a the key with crowdfunding, and it really is the case with most investments, is the disclosure piece. And it's the, the disclosure piece is the worst case scenario. So I should know as the investor that really um, this is highly risky, and if this, thing, if this doesn't work out, setting aside fraud, my money is going to disappear. That disclosure has to be there. And importantly, Lynn has created a document, a general template. So if you're interested in crowdfunding, uh, investment opportunity of starting a business in Montana, please uh, call in and uh, we'll help you with the disclosure. We'll get you um, uh, the exemption applied and you're off and running. Annuities, a big form of uh, fraud um, in, with our office, unfortunately. Um, you, I think f most people know uh, what they are, that there's a guarantee uh, of a fixed or variable payment um, at some future, future time. Usually folks who are uh, uh, ready for retirement. Um, it can be good, but most, t most of the time, I think it's fair to say, I'll say, uh, it's, it's bad, uh, depending on your circumstances. High surrender penalties. So if, you, uh, if you're looking to retire soon and somebody puts you into an annuity and you need to access that annuity in a couple years, you're paying surrender penalties. Usually about seven years, your surrender penalties will go away. Keep that in mind. The other thing to uh, remember with annuities, my mother had an annuity and her broker sent her a blank form. If you get a blank form by your broker, that should be a red flag. Sent her a blank form saying, uh, sign this and send it back to me. She sends it to me and like, what? I don't know what I'm signing here. And I gave it to Lynn. Lynn, what, what is this about? And she was being flipped. Her annuity was being flipped. And what that means is she was in an annuity. She had gone through the surrender period. So if she needed to access it, the surrender penalties wouldn't apply. But the broker was going to put her in a new annuity, get a commission, seven-year seven year surrender penalty period was applying again. Wow. You would be surprised at how often this happens. So the blank form thing should be a big red flag. But particularly with if you have an annuity or you know somebody who is in an annuity, the biggest downfall is the surrender, well, I shouldn't say biggest, one of the biggest are the surrender penalties and, um, and stay in it. Don't, don't get flipped into a new one because that, that clock is going to start kick, ticking again. These annuities are typically uh, peddled at free lunches or free dinners where uh, folks will say, you know, the, the stock market is doing bad, get, it, get you into a fixed annuity or a uh, um, variable annuity. Um, and they'll make, make it sound all, uh, oh so good. 
um, and uh, unfortunately a lot of the folks who are going to those um, are getting taken advantage of. The under Reg D, private placements, of all the things that I've talked about this far, biggest source of fraud in my opinion that we see. And the reason it's, that this is, it's Reg D under the SEC, in Rural 506 typically, and what that means is you can do private, placement, uh, private placements without having to be registered. And so when we see fraud, like Richard Reynolds, the guy with the chair over his head, he had private placement memoranda that he would give to his, um, give to his victims, and he'd say, because you have to say, this is a Reg D 506 uh, offering that's exempt from uh, registration. Not true. And so he would, so you, just by saying it, does it mean, does it mean that it's, it's exempt? Uh, no, it's not. And so these are non-public offerings, highly risky, very illiquid, um, and really you're high, you're high net worth investors. You're accredited investors, and that's the other thing. If you're an accredited investor, usually you're, you're not usually, your net worth is above a million dollars. And that's the other thing, a lot of these investments that are only be offered to accredited investors for good reason. They can afford the risk, and they have the level of, uh, of sophistication. If someone's pushing to you at your door, or uh, like Mr. Reynolds did when he went to churches and saying, I'm making this op uh, offering to you, uh, and it's a private placement offering, it's a scam. So the Reg D, when you hear Reg D or 506 uh, and a private placement <laughs> offering, it should, red flag, it should be a big uh, red flag, and I've talked about the millions uh, or, or uh, the million dollar uh, net worth piece. All right, so we're, we're finishing up here and, and then I'll close and we have a few minutes for questions. This is, I can't take credit for the, the video. This is Lynn's creativity. You wouldn't hire an organist without hearing them first. Charge. <laughs> so why would you invest without checking broker check? Check your broker with broker check. It's so true. Um, you know, uh, my wife and I, we got married in 2007, and it was the music was so important. We had, um, we, we listened to the people that sent us, um, sent us the, the CDs or whatever so that we could see. And you'd be shocked in the investment world how people blindly, Give people their money. Fifty. Th what, the, the, the case of the uh, not not it wasn't Catherine, but one of the ladies who who talked her mom. Writing fifty thousand, twenty five thousand dollar checks. To her broker. But then gonna, um, uh, you know, complain about the the service and not, and not give a five dollar tip um, to a waiter or waitress. This is remarkable to me. <laughs> How we were, we're, we're penny pinches over here, but then somebody who, who looks fancy, good salesman, um, making, making it sound really good, and I'm going to write a $50,000 check. Re absolutely remarkable to me. Or somebody comes to me, a friend, and says, hey, you give me $100,000, and um, I'll give you a 25% rate of return in 90 days. <coughs> the individual goes, has good credit, gets a loan from the bank for $100,000. Doesn't have the money. Gets the loan. Gives him the money. And he's, he steals it. Running a Ponzi scheme. Happened in Kalispell. I mean, it's, it's craziness. So uh, the, the due diligence be, be this, I'm, I'm cynic, Monica will tell you that. But be skeptical. Be skeptical of what people are trying to push you. And most importantly, I think, and I'm biased, call us. Please call us at the beginning and, and for, with questions. And even after the fact, don't be embarrassed if you've been scammed. Please call us. We can help. We've gotten a lot of money back from people who've been defrauded. So with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Yes, ma'am. Reverse mortgage. The question is, yeah, I mean, we don't, hand, we don't deal with the, the mortgages. Um, there. I will tell you, I think your instinct, she said it sounds like a scam. I think your instinct is, is uh, correct. There, I, um, there. I know for some folks, we had a guy who called about reverse mortgage, uh, reverse mortgage, and was doing it, and it actually made sense to him uh, to do it. So it's not just, it's not 
completely fraudulent, um, but it's something to be skeptical of. But we don't handle the, the mortgage piece. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the question is, can we talk a little bit about identity um, theft? So that, the, the Attorney General's Office um, uh, handles the identity theft uh, piece. The, the key for folks to know, if you want to know about your identity or you want your credit report, and look, make sure everything's okay, annualcreditreport.com is free. You see, I, I laugh, or excuse me, dot gov, thank you. Thank you, thank you. You guys already know this, but you can check. And I laugh, I see all these ads, but yeah, you, you, you know, this is free. It's not free. So yeah, thank you for that. But yeah, I know, this is good, it's good. Yeah, my brother did too. Yeah, it's a, it's a disaster. Fr freezing your credit is really important when that happens. And it's a pain, but it's a good way to protect yourself. Yeah. Any other questions? Somebody... Oh, yes, ma'am. Question is, do we, ha do we have, or the uh, collection agencies, you say? Yeah, the question is, do we have jurisdiction over credit uh, bureaus or collection agencies? The answer is no, unfortunately. Um, Monica asked. Yeah, I would, the, I, the Attorney General's office would be the place I'd go to if there's, certainly if there are debt collection practices that um, are, yeah, definitely the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. Jesse? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Hi. yes, Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm uh, a voice. Yes, a real quick question about, it seems like there's some research out there that has shown that when somebody has pre-dementia, pre-Alzheimer's, that they're really making unfortunate really bad financial decisions. Are you seeing that in your office that maybe these are people that, you know, 30 years ago wouldn't have made that decision, but today because of the difference in the brain that they are making really bad financial decisions with there investments? There is no question about it. I would say over half, at least over half of our fraudulent cases are folks who have uh, early signs of dementia. That, that lady I referenced who uh, was writing the, the $50,000 checks, 90 years old. Uh, and in the early forms of dementia. And we had the doctor, we had, we had the trial and we, we accused him of elder exploitation. He was found guilty and we had the doc, I mean she was being treated, her, her, her daughter was helping. Uh, it's why last legislative session we said if you're over, and folks didn't like this, but if you're over the age of 60, because th those are most of our victims who are over the age of 60, not only are many folks uh, vulnerable, as they because the statistics are you get above 70, uh, they're higher risk clearly for those kinds of diseases. Um, not only are they vulnerable, they've accumulated some some wealth, um, and so we 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 uh, adopted uh, or asked for legislation to be able to help folks more in ter for purposes of restitution who are over that over that age because those are most of our victims, sadly. <laughs> And I know my, my time is up. I'm, I'll be around for a little while. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. But really appreciate you being here this morning and listening. All right, every, everyone. Um, I just really want to impress upon you one thing that Jesse said, and that is the fact that you really do want to do your due diligence when you are getting ready to invest. Because I can tell you that it's been our experience, and this is absolutely true, um, literally on, in almost every single case when somebody has become a victim of um, securities fraud or financial fraud, it's from somebody that they trusted. Because what, what, what the perpetrator will do is that they will actually develop a trust relationship with you. And literally, it can be anybody. It could be someone in your family, unfortunately. It can be somebody in your church, somebody in your community, somebody that you trust, unfortunately, is the one that ends up doing this to you. And so that's why it's important, as Jesse pointed out, no matter what, 
do your due diligence. And the easiest way to do that is to call our office so that we can make sure that that person, number one, is registered with this office to do business, that the securities that they're offering is actually registered as well, and that you understand exactly what's happening. Because I'll tell you what, sometimes that one phone call um, can mean <laughs> the difference between not only you but others losing their life savings. And uh, for elderly folks in particular, I think that it's really difficult sometimes to admit when you have been a victim of financial or securities fraud because, number one, you're embarrassed. Uh, number two, um, you're afraid that perhaps you may lose your financial independence. And as a result, you're not really willing to say anything. But you have to remember, if you've been a victim, that means somebody else has. So until you make that phone call um, so that we can begin the investigation and hopefully bring that person um, to justice and potentially get your money back then as well, um, they're going to continue to do what they're doing. So really important to make that phone call. All right, off of my soapbox. Yeah. <laughs>